In this chapter, we're going to look at installing and configuring Windows Server 2008. Of course, we're going to be talking about Windows Server 2008 and how it functions in a network infrastructure and various roles that allow it to do that. But to begin, we really need to just make sure we've covered the basics. And the basics are, how do you install the server? What are the different versions? Uh, what about hardware requirements? How do I actually install roles and features? And what are the functionality that uh, those provide? Also look at a server core installation option because especially for infrastructure servers, uh, that really is going to be a good choice in many cases. Okay, so uh, the information here really just serves as a, as a groundwork, getting us ready to move forward and deal with individual network infrastructure roles specifically. Let's start by looking at the installation of Windows servers. We're going to talk about the different features and versions, your scenarios and uh, considerations for installs and the actual install process. And we won't actually go through an installation because really they're fairly easy uh, at this point. And you'll see that the installations, you're not even asked a whole lot of information. The vast majority of the configuration is going to, to come after the fact. Uh, and so once you've installed one version of Windows, really you've installed them all, especially at this point. But we do want to know what's happening and we do want to know uh, the different choices that we are going to have that will affect the overall install process. First, let's talk about some of the features. Windows Server 2008 uh, is the successor to Windows Server 2003. Uh, and as such, it adds many features and benefits, plus we have features and benefits that are then, uh, then exist in the R2 version. If you're installing Windows Server 2008 at this point, you will most certainly be installing the R2 version. We'll be working with and talking about the R2 uh, version throughout this course. Uh, what are some of those features and benefits? Well, you do have uh, enhanced storage management through the use of iSCSI. Uh, natively being able to connect to iSCSI SANS with the iSCSI Initiator uh, service. We've also just got some additional options with, uh, with disk management. We've got increased control over desktops using group policy. Now, it's an Active Directory functionality, which we won't really be touching in this course, but it does represent the ability to manage the configuration of desktops throughout the enterprise, and there's a great deal of control that you can exert. Uh, Windows Server 2008 is going to increase that control, uh, integrating things like network access protection, the ability to uh, issue directives towards BitLocker drive encryption on operating system drives and flash drives, uh, the ability to control which types of devices are installed and, uh, and the like. I mean, there are going to be many new changes with group policy in relation to Windows Server 2008. One of those, more secure network control with network access protection. I just mentioned being able to control that with group policy, but network access protection as a whole is a brand new feature. That is something that we'll go through in later, uh, or in more detail later in this course. Uh, but network access protection really represents the ability to control whether or not clients can actually connect to the network based on the quote unquote health of the client. And so we can use determining factors like the presence of a firewall or antivirus to determine whether you're deemed healthy enough to connect to our corporate network. Really a great concept, not necessarily unique to Microsoft, but uh, something that is built into Windows Server 2008. And we have virtualization through Hyper-V. With Windows Server 2008, Microsoft finally brings a competitive product uh, into the virtualization uh, you know, sphere of things. Uh, so for so long, the virtualization has really been dominated by other third-party uh, uh, companies, vendors like VMware and Citrix, and Microsoft just didn't really have a real competitive offering. Virtual Server 2005 R2, not not great. Not from a not not really from a production virtualization you know standpoint. So with Hyper-V, you do have a hypervisor. Uh, a hypervisor means that there's direct access for the VMs to the hardware. They don't really have to go through the host operating system. That performs much better, far more scalable. Uh, 2008's first version of Hyper-V, you know, 2008 R2 version 2.0, much better. And then moving forward, Hyper-V continues to be uh, to increase the number of features and benefits that it provides. So that, that's a big role here in Windows Server 2008. 
We have deployment options using Windows deployment services, technically the successor to remote installation services. This is the ability to deploy the operating system in an imaged form. Uh, and so WDS can serve as the central point of an imaging infrastructure where we can push out both client and server operating systems to machines. Uh, those machines can boot up automatically to the network using what's called a Pixie boot. They can connect to the WDS server and we can push images to them. Uh, there are many enhancements in the area of terminal services. That's also not uh, really a, an area that we're going to deal with in this course, but a, a big, big advance, big area of advancement uh, technically now in R2. Uh, 2008 called it terminal services. Windows Server 2008 R2 renamed it to remote desktop services. Uh, same thing, but we have all kinds of options from remote apps to uh, the uh, uh, remote desktop gateways to the web page for, administ uh, for administration and making desktops available and whatnot. It's a, just a huge subject, a lot of, lot of new changes uh, in that area. And increased security for Active Directory using read-only domain controllers and the server core installation option. Uh, and those are just a few. Another one that we could certainly add uh, that we will be discussing in this course is the concept of direct access, a new feature for 2008 R2 that is meant to be an alternative to the virtual private network uh, infrastructures and those connections that we're allowing users to have. Also, uh, branch cache, the ability to increase efficiency for file access for users in branch offices. Uh, those are both two 08 R2 uh, int uh, introductions, and those two we will be uh, looking at in greater detail. And, and certainly, you know, that's not all of the features or benefits. Those are some of the, uh, the highlights, if you will. Uh, as we go throughout, we're going to see changes in various areas uh, if you're familiar with Server 2003. Windows Server 2008 does come in a number of different additions. Uh, sometimes this can get a little bit confusing because there are so many additions. You know? And so this is certainly a choice that we're going to have to make when we're installing a server. Uh, now, in part, this is just the hardware that is supported. So you want to check the hardware uh, limitations for each of these systems to know when you might have to go uh, beyond a particular version, for instance, standard edition, you know, and how much how much memory does uh, standard edition uh, support versus data center? Well, you know, that's the kind of thing that we're going to have to look at. In general, the reason that this is so over the top is because most of us are just going to deal with one of three versions, um, and we are going to be dealing with you know either standard enterprise or data center edition. Essentially, you know, hardware is not usually hardware is not usually a big uh, push, a big reason why we choose one over the other. For instance, you know, 32 gigs is tops out standard edition um, as to the amount of of memory. You know, now that's really only relevant 64 bit uh, with a 64 bit processor, but uh, that you would be able to address that much memory. If you needed to go beyond that. Maybe you've got a Hyper-V host or a, a database server in a larger environment, then you'd be going enterprise in, or, or data center. What usually happens, though, is that we need some feature in enterprise or data center that is not in standard. And actually, there are, that's few and far between. You know, so uh, really, failover clustering is about the only one that's not supported in standard edition. Uh, network load balancing and failover clustering, two methods of clustering uh, that if you need those, you're going to have to have enterprise or, or data center. So, I mean, if you are dealing with a server that's very large and it's got a, you know, uh, a larger number of processors, larger number of, uh, of uh, memory, you need to, do need to check. I mean, I don't want to exceed, I can't exceed the capabilities of the, of the operating system. Uh, but I think in reality, that's less of an issue versus the uh, the feature support that we have. Uh, for a web server, there is the web server edition. Uh, this is a lower cost alternative to a full version of Windows. Uh, it provides, you know, limited numbers of roles. You can't make it a domain controller. You can't put Hyper-V on it. It's, it's just there for a web service, really, to offer a, a, some competition to other lower cost alternatives like, you know, various Linux distributions that can be run uh, and are running as web servers throughout the internet. So Microsoft wanted to provide an option 
on a Windows Server 2008 machine. You do have a version of 08 for Itanium systems. Uh, that's specifically the Itanium processor. At this point, though, the Itanium processor is kind of, kind of dying and, and falling off, and so that, that's unlikely to be used. You have an HPC or High Performance Computing Edition. That is for, you know, monstrous uh, machines that would go beyond even the data center functionality. You know, each of these standard enterprise and data, data center can also come with or without Hyper-V, so it just depends on what you're trying to do. If you don't plan on using the Hyper-V version, the non-Hyper-V uh, versions are a little bit cheaper. And they all come in 32-bit or 64-bit. Now, the, the uh, exception to that is that Windows 2008 R2 is the first Windows server that is only 64-bit. Uh, and so there is no 32-bit version when you get into 08 R2. All right. Everything except for the web and the Itanium will support the server core installation option. So that standard enterprise data center, notice it's not a different version of Windows. It's an installation option that we'll talk about a little bit more, but essentially it's a command line uh, only. And, and that's uh, primarily to increase security, although it has some other additional features and benefits. You also need to think about the hardware requirements, although this in reality is probably just more of an exam type of thing. It's unlikely that you would be wanting to install Windows Server on a machine that didn't meet these requirements, at least not a production system. Uh, so, uh, you know, it'd be fairly rare for me to be attempting to install and fail to meet these hardware requirements. That doesn't mean that Microsoft won't necessarily test on it, you know, so I do want to know what the bare minimum requirements are for Windows. For the processor, the minimum is one gigahertz. Uh, memory, your minimum is 512 uh, megabytes, disk space 8 gigs, and then of course you need a DVD player and, uh, because the media is on DVD or you can have alternative methods. You don't necessarily have to have a DVD. You can mount uh, an ISO, you can extract the files onto a flash drive or, or something, something like that. All right. In reality, in production environments, I don't care what the minimums are. I want to know what this server is doing, what roles and features is it going to have on it, you know, and therefore that defines how much memory we're going to have. I, I would venture to say that the bare minimum on most production servers at this point is probably going to be about four gigs of RAM, uh, maybe smaller environments if you've got a server that's not doing a whole lot can function on less than that, but I, I think that's a, that's a pretty good starting point. Uh, so Microsoft comes out with minimums and then the recommended, and you gotta remember that those are just base values. So you have, we have to take into account the roles that are gonna be installed on this system, the number of clients that it's supporting with said roles, uh, you know, the number of servers performing this function throughout the environment, all of those are, are factors, you know, and we want to try to get as far away from the minimum requirement as possible to ensure an efficiently operating production system.